Hey folks, welcome to October's WWGOA Live. We really want to thank our sponsor, Titebond, for helping us out with this and helping keep this event free for you. So I think without further ado, let's uh, jump right into questions. Got anything there, Krista? Yeah, Carl says, my husband is making a three-dimensional frame holding a 16-inch sawmill blade. He is using three-quarter material end grain. He needs to know the secrets of the setup on the lock miter router bit. Wow. Um, so go on www.goa.com and we've got information there. The, I love setting up tools and doing stuff live here now. The lock miter is too complicated for me to do that and it takes, uh, it takes quite a bit of material to get the setup right. So I'm going to do this a couple of things. We've got information about this on GOA, www.goa.com. When I'm done with this and I go through the questions, I'll provide whatever links I can in an answer to this question in order to help you with this. Um, a couple of keys. One is that when you prep your material for the project, also prep scrap material, test material at the same time. And the reason is that when you set up the lock miter, the thickness of the project material and the thickness of the test pieces has to be exactly, exactly, exactly the same. Um, and it'll often take me, geez, it, it could take six test, test pieces because you're going to do, you're going to use each one for half the joint. So three setups in order to get a lock miter set up just right. Um, but I'll, I'll provide some information in the answer when we're done here. But it's unfortunately, that's way more complicated than I can do live now. Okay, uh, John says, if you need to cut a three quarter inch dado for plywood and you have a plywood router bit, is it better to use the router or the table saw? Uh, great question. So let's, let's get a visual aid. Um, I'm gonna come right back. And what in the world of router bits, if you're not familiar with this, what Jack's talking about are plywood specific router bits. So this is a set of them. And the theory with plywood router bits is that plywood with three quarter inch stock, it tends to run a 32nd of an inch undersized. So instead of three quarters of an inch, it's 23 30 seconds. So this, the largest of the cutters, it is not a three quarter inch bit, it's a 23 30 seconds. So the theory is, brr, one pass with that and my ply will fit. So the theory is good, the practice isn't always as good because what I've found is that although we want to call plywood 23, 30 seconds, it very rarely is exactly that. In fact, um, a dado I cut just two days ago was only a tiny bit over 11 16th. So it was even less than 23, 30 seconds. So my feeling is that there's two good approaches to this. One is to do a stackable dado head on the table saw, pointing my table saw over here. Stackable dado head on the table saw, I think that will lead to the best possible fit that you can get at the table saw. If you want to do this with router bits, what I would do is not do a single pass with the 23, 30 seconds. I would use a jig or a setup that allows me to do two passes with a smaller bit resulting in a perfect dado. And that's going to give you a much better fit. And the, if, you don't, if you don't have a good fit, you're going to compromise the strength of the joint. So for me, um, if I'm doing casework, every dado is cut, stackable dado head on the table saw. Okay, thanks George. Uh, Reslin asks, on maple solid hardwood, shall I apply pre-staining shellac zinser before staining with gray color general finishes gel stain? Maybe. So finishing is a funky thing and um, there's there, the best answer to this is you need to test what you're, test both and see what, re, what provides the result that you want. So the benefit to putting um, a sealer on like Zinsser Seal Coat on there first is that you're not going to get the dark, dark, dark stain that you would get if you just put the stain directly on the wood. The other benefit in woods like maple and pine and birch is that a wood conditioner or seal coat will help prevent the wood from getting blotchy. Now you're also, because you're not going to get the depth of penetration because you've got that 
seal coat on there, um, you're not going to get as dark a color. So what I would do is, is take maple from your project, sand it just the way you're going to sand the real project, sand it to that extent, and on one raw wood, just put on the gray, and then on the other one, do the seal coat and then the gray and see which look you like better. Um, and this trick of using seal coat as a pre-sealer before the stain goes on is a great way to go. Um, porous woods like uh, cedar, it's another great place to use it there. Um, coat of that seal coat on there before the stain goes on, you won't get that dark, dark, dark color that you would otherwise get. So it's a great trick to know about and it's worth experimenting with in your finishing process. All right, Tim says, could you comment on the characteristics of commonly used wood species that make them desirable or undesirable for use in different kinds of woodworking projects, such as cabinets, tabletops, bookcases, chairs, etc.? Well, Tim, that's a pretty broad question. Um, commonly used wood, so I don't know, you know, it kind of depends on where you live. Where I am here, Oak is such a commodity wood, red oak is such a commodity wood, very widely available. Lots and lots of houses are trimmed out in red oak. Should you then also make your bookcases out of red oak so it matches the trim in the house? Maybe, possibly, I don't know. Um, broad strokes, let's talk about common North American hardwoods. Um, cherry, maple, birch, walnut, red oak. Um, of them, red oak is very porous and um, that can affect you on the finishing side. That porosity means it's not great for cutting boards. Um, walnut, hard, hard maple, walnut, cherry are way more closed grain than red oak is. Um, that closed grain makes them good for turnings, better choice than red oak. Um, also, um, better choices for cutting boards. And, you know, I don't know, outside of that, what I would do is say, if you like how walnut looks, don't worry, don't worry about choosing the wood because of its working characteristics, but instead learn about the working characteristics and then go ahead and use the wood that you want to use. And that'll be part of your learning curve as a woodworker. Um, but it's a good learning curve because then it's another skill that you've mastered. So um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say what you've learned about maple here is something that should prevent you from using maple. I would just figure out what do you need to do in order to make something out of maple if that's what you want, that's the wood you want to use. So um, there are a lot of books out there that will really drill down in detail, and I'm sure there's stuff on the web as well, that'll really drill, drill down in detail on working characteristics of material. And that would be beneficial to find out before you start cutting into it. Um, but yeah, I would just pick the wood, pick the wood you want to work with, and then figure out what you got to do to make it come out okay. Okay. Frank says, I didn't get a chance to ask a question on the other night's gold event about dados, but maybe you can answer it here. I am making a large picture frame and want to use half lap mitered corners. Is the best way, in your opinion, to use a dado stack to cut the half laps, or would you suggest a better method? Yeah, it's, uh, so let me, let me, let me, let me, let me grab a couple sticks of wood. So this isn't, uh, these aren't great representations of what he's going to do with his mitered half lap, but I can kind of talk you through it. So on a mitered half lap, what's going to happen is we're going to cut a miter on this piece, but not all the way through. We're going to leave a portion of it behind. Then we're going to do the same thing here, but if we leave the back behind on this one, yeah, I'm trying to make sure I said this right. If we leave the back behind on this piece with a miter here, we're going to leave the front behind on this piece with a miter, and then when they overlay each other, you get lots and lots and lots of strength because we've got a half lap joint underneath that's actually holding them together. So to answer your question, yeah, I would definitely do that. Um, uh, use your miter gauge, stack old dado head on the table saw, and that's a great way to go to produce that joint. It's a really good way to do it. Eric says, I have some standing dead elm in the woods at home. I'm considering resawing the elm for small projects. Is elm worth the experiment? I hear elm is not good for woodworking. I would tend to disagree. Um, as luck would have it, 
I was uh, I was helping a manufacturer out with some turning, uh, I don't know, within the last week or so. And these are a couple of Elm bowls that I turned. And I think Elm is a very um, uh, underrated wood. I think it's really pretty. Um, this one is, uh, they actually came out of the same blank, um, but this one's got some spalting in it that's really cool. Spalting is a little bit of fungus. So I think the grain is pretty. I think the color contrast is pretty. pretty. The heartwood tends to be not quite chocolate color, not like walnut, but dark. And then the sapwood a little bit lighter. And if you leave them both in, the piece, it creates a really cool contrast. Um, it's difficult to work with because it can be, um, it's a little bit like machining and stuff in the cottonwood and the aspen family. It's, it's got a stringy grain. And so it doesn't always uh, plane superbly well. So you might end up planing to a certain extent and then taking care of the rest of that surface with sanding because sanding will be easier on the stringiness than planing will. Um, but yeah, I would definitely cut some of it up. Um, if you're doing any turning at all, I would set aside some blanks for turning because it's a, it's a really pretty bowl wood. Um, and even for furniture, I, on my sawmill years ago, I cut up a bunch of elm into four quarter planks. Um, and it was very cool. I liked it a lot. I would definitely use it. All right. Bruce says, should the face frame of a cabinet be flush with the inside or outside edge of the carcass? Well, it kind of depends. Let me, um, let me get a cabinet. It's like the, the night of visual aids. So here's a real simple wall cabinet. This is the, um, this is the cabinet we do here in my shop in the two day cabinet making class. And it's also the cabinet that's offered online through WWGOA in the online streaming class. So if you can't get here and you wanna do cabinet making, you can do this cabinet online. So in this case, um, it's full of paper towels. On the inside of the cabinet right here, the inside of the face frame is sticking past the inside of the case and it's flush with the outside. But down at the very bottom, the top of the face frame is even with the bottom of the cabinet. So that's the it depends part. Um, in most cases, I'm thinking a little bit, but in most cases you're going to find that the face frame is flush with the outside. There are applications where you leave what's called a scribe on the outside. The face frame projects past a little bit, um, but it's almost always going to project into the cabinet except in the case of the bottom shelf. And the reason, um, if you look at commercial cabinets, on a lot of them, the lower rail, this bottom rail in the cabinet, is above the bottom shelf. And that's because it's easier for them to do on a big commercial basis. And I hate that, because I hate when you're taking stuff out of the cabinet, you have to lift it up over the little step that that creates. So it's a little bit more work, but my preference in building a cabinet is to make the top of the bottom and the top of the bottom rail flush with each other. And I think it's a better, it's a better look and a better net result. All right, thank you, George. Um, Bob says, when finishing with shellac, what is your procedure? What is the final sanding grit that you use? Well, I'm kind of the wrong guy to ask because I never use shellac as a final, final finish. So I use shellac a lot as a base coat. Um, and when I do that, what's going to happen next is I'm going to top coat it with a water-based lacquer. Um, when I do that, I'm sanding at 220 before the water-based lacquer goes on. But I don't know if that really answers your question because it's not, um, if what you're looking at is like a French polish kind of an approach, then I'm not your guy for that because I've never done it. Okay, thank you. We are here with George Von Driska, Managing Editor of Woodworkers Guild of America. If you don't do so already, um, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and sign up for the free newsletter at www.goa.com and we want to thank Titefon for sponsoring this video to make it nice and free for you guys. Okay, Johnny says, why is it so hard to get a good dado using a single blade with multiple passes? Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, well, you stay, you stay where you are.
but this will be a zoom thing. If I find the right blade. All right. So there's a lot of it depends, Johnny. It depends on your blade choice is kind of the number one thing. So let's, Krista, have you come in on, right on the teeth of this blade first. And we really want to see this tooth right here if we can. This particular tooth pattern is called a triple chip grind. So easy to identify because it's got a grind and a grind and a grind. So that's the triple chip part. The tooth in front of this one is flat, but this tooth has got that tombstone shape to it. When you use this blade to cut a groove or subsequently a dado, it's not going to be perfectly flat bottom because of the shape of this tooth. Now, let me see if you stay where you are, if I can just bring in another blade. All right, is that in the right spot to see teeth? Yep. All right. So this one is an alternate top bevel blade, ATB. Um, very simple to identify. One tooth that points to my right, one to the left, one to the right, one to the left. So similar to the triple chip grind, if we do a dado or a groove with this type of blade, it won't leave a flat bottom because of the shape of the teeth. It's cutting out here and it's cutting out here, but it's actually a little bit lower profile in the center, so it leaves a little high spot. The last one All right, is that good? Mm -hmm. This one is called a flat top grind. So it's this tooth is flat, this tooth is flat. If I keep going, all the teeth are flat. If I do a dado or a groove with this tooth pattern, I do get a flat bottom groove or a flat bottom dado. So, Johnny, the problem, you, you can get a good quality cut on the bottom of the dado if you use the right blade. But if you're doing a triple chip or an alternate top bevel blade, you're not going to get a flat bottom of the dado. you got to use a FTG, flat top grind, and that will give you a flat bottom. All right, David says, do you have any tips for a smooth finish when painting MDF? Yeah, um, a couple. Um, so here's the problem with MDF. As luck would have it, here's a bandsaw jig made out of MDF. Um, when MDF is made, it's compressed like crazy. A lot of heat and a lot of pressure. Somebody told me once that when they make MDF, this slurry of stuff, sawdust and glue, is 15 inches thick on the infeed side. And under lots of heat and lots of pressure, comes out 3 quarters of an inch thick on the outfeed side. That's a lot of push. So as a result, because it goes under these big rollers, this face and this, flight, this face, they're really smooth. They paint like a dream. You don't need to do anything there. But the problem is the porosity of these edges. Um, I once did an office, cabinets for an office. It was all going to be painted, so everything was MDF. The cabinet cases, the face frames, raised panel doors, drawer fronts, everything was MDF. The key to making that work is that before the final paint goes on, you need to do a little bit of sanding, sand these to about 180 or 220 grit, and then you need to seal them. And you can seal them with a uh, Zinsser seal coat, is just de-wax shellac. So you can seal them with de-wax shellac, or there's also, um, I believe it's also Zinsser makes bin products, which are a primer, and those would go on here first. And you want to put on the de-wax shellac or the primer until you can tell as that goes on that you're getting a smooth surface. And when you do that correctly, you'll find that this edge matches this face perfectly. You don't get all that. Um, if you don't do it, if you don't seal them ahead of time, when the paint hits this, it all soaks in like a sponge. And you'll be able to see right through the paint that it's all kind of cratery. 
If you do it correctly, this look this will look great. So either DWAC shellac or um, bin B I N primer, and that'll take care of that for you. Dropping stuff. All right. Bobby says now and then I make log cookies and need to sand them smooth. Of course, I should try to cut each one a uniform thickness to minimize the amount of material that needs to be removed. Besides that, what TPI bandsaw blade would you recommend for cutting these green wood to get a smoother cut? And how would you recommend initial sanding, like 80 or 120 grit? I happen to know that using the planer is not a good way to do this. I hope you didn't find out the hard way that using the planer is not a good way to do this. So, um, so what he's talking about here is, uh, I don't have a log in here taking the log, a cylinder, and cutting it this way to get log cookies. Um, what we end up with then are these segments, these cross sections that are all end grain. That's why they cannot go through a planer, just like end grain cutting boards can't go through a planer. So, um, to, let's see, so a couple questions out of this. What blade? Um, I would probably be using a four tooth per inch blade we got to have a fairly aggressive tooth pattern to clear the waste out of there. And um, yes, if you go finer, you can get a smoother cut, but the blade is really going to struggle if you go too fine because you're not going to be able to clear the waste fast enough to be able to continue the cut. So I would do a four tooth per inch. You could push that maybe up to a six TPI and try that. Um, 10 is going to be way too fine. Then um, what grit to start sanding? Well, I don't know, because it's going to depend on how kerflui your cookies are. Um, if they're really bad, maybe you got to start with 60 grit. If they're reasonably good, maybe you can start with 120 grit. So it's like any sanding operation, it's going to be a function of how much wood you got to take off to get them where you want them. Um, there are router-based jigs out there that might be good for you. and. Uh, what it does is, what this jig does is, and I'll, I'll look on GOA to see if we have this available where you can see it, and if it is, I'll put it in the answer to your question. Um, but just a big box, and your thing goes in there, your end grain cutting board or your log cookie or whatever it is, and then riding on top of this box, there's a bridge. And on that bridge, you make the bridge so it'll accept a handheld router. So what happens when you use this thing is that the cookie or the end grain cutting board is in there and you're passing the router back and forth over the top of it. And when you do that, you're trimming off just a tiny bit of wood. And then you can increase the depth of cut and come back and trim off a little bit more, trim off a little bit more. And one of the benefits you'll get out of this is it will force the two faces to be perfectly parallel to each other. And it's a whole lot faster than trying to make that happen through sanding. Uh, so like I said, if that, if that resource is available on GOA, I'll provide a link for you. Um, but that would be, that router would be a really good, the router setup like that would be a really good first step. All right, thank you. Doug says, I see the Titebond banner in the background. What is the difference in holding power between the three Titebond glues if setup time is not an issue? Oh, I don't think there's any holding power issue at all. I don't think there's any compromise, but I don't, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Google probably knows. Um, type on one, type on two, type on three. I don't base my choice on holding power. I base it on where the thing is going to live when it's done. If it's an indoor project, I'm using type on one. If it's an outdoor project, it's either two or three. Um, two, if it's going to get damp, like an Adirondack chair, Three, if it's going to be wet, like a flower box where there's constantly moisture inside it. Um, but from a, from a strength of joint perspective, they're going to be interchangeable, I think. Okay, perfect. Um, Dale says, hi George, I recently cut down some dead standing black walnut trees. My moisture meter said it was at 6%. However, when I turned a rather large bowl, I stopped for the evening and in the morning and found an ugly crack in the bull's side. Is 6% still too wet for black walnut turning? No, 6% is great dry. That's, I mean, that's a number you get when you kiln dry hardwoods. So I would say this is more a function of releasing tension on the wood. So it'd be interesting to know a little bit more about the blank. Um, but my suspicion would be that there we were 
were talking about elm earlier. There's an elm bowl I turn. Um, my suspicion would be that the crack appeared out here on the pith of the walnut um, and probably radiates out this way. Um, and I think it's just probably anytime I'm turning stuff that's from a tree as opposed to wood that's had a chance to air dry for years and years and years or um, has been kiln dried, I always either do the turning start to finish in one fell swoop or if I have to stop for an extended period of time, I take the bowl off the lathe, I put it in a plastic bag, I fill it with chips from that turning and then leave that set, then come back and start again the next day or whenever you're going to come back. It's just good insurance to make sure that um, this kind of thing doesn't happen. So I think you're okay on the moisture content, but I think just because as you hollowed, you relieved pressure, it reacted. And um, if it dried to 6% as a log, there was probably all sorts of internal pressure in there because it's wood just doesn't dry well as a log. So that's my, that's my guess is that that pressure got the better of it and that's what caused the crack. Okay. Richard says, how do you remove water stains from a veneer desktop without damaging the veneer? I am not a furniture refinishing kind of a guy. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stuff out there about getting water rings out of finish. Um, how many of them work effectively or not, I don't know. Um, and especially in a case where you've got veneer, which is probably a 28th of an inch thick, that's pretty darn thin. Um, I would hate to give you bad advice. So I would either um, contact a furniture refinisher, maybe do just a little bit of Googling to see what you can find. But, it, but there's also going to be an it depends of what kind of finish is on there. Um, so I would, I'm just not enough of an expert to give you good advice on that. And I don't want to, I don't want to screw up a veneered piece. Okay. Um, Candace says, I'm wanting to make some countertops in my kitchen from wood. Do you have a suggestion on the type of wood I should use and the type of finish I should use to make it food safe? Well, maple is a pretty common choice. Um, and if you, you know, if you go to a butcher shop and you look at the cutting boards and everything they have there, they're almost commonly, they're most commonly hard maple. Um, so hard maple is a great choice. It, it has very little porosity, which means um, it's not going to soak up a lot of schmutz that might end up on your countertop. For a finish, I don't know, that's a tough call. I, I would do some more research on this outside of me because um, you want a couple things. You want it to be durable because this is a, it's like a workbench in your shop. You're going to be using it all the time. So you want it to be durable, but you want to be able to set an apple on there and not worry about stuff migrating into the apple. So I don't know, you know, durability would come from a polyurethane. Um, food safe would come from mineral oil. Um, I don't know. Um, mineral oil isn't going to give you much protection over the long haul. So um, I, I think you need to do a little bit more research. I'm, I'm solid with the answer of hard maple. That would be a great choice. Um, but I'm not so solid with what a good answer would be for finish for that. A little more research. Okay. Mike asks, George, I am setting up my first wood shop in my basement. Most of my tools are bench top with a full size saw stop and full size jointer. Does it make sense to put everything on mobile stands? Yes. My shop is 3,600 square feet and everything in here is on casters. Everything in here is on casters. So it's just, you know, you change your mind, you want to move stuff around, you, you get some task in there that's bigger than anything else you've done before so you got to just push some tools against the wall casters are your best friend all right john says do you have any tricks to make sandpaper last longer yes let's uh we can do a visual here so we can walk over in that direction is there anything like leading up to the standing here we should answer or should we just make a move we can just move all right let me uh let me grab a piece of wood this sander and if you come right in tight on this disc please that'd be wonderful twelve inch disc I think this is a hundred grit paper on here right now so 
Um, this is a piece of 2x4, so it's, I don't know, spruce, pine, or fir, um, which if you didn't know that, when it says SPF on dimensional lumber, that's what that stands for, spruce, pine, fir. Um, let me just do a little sanding. I'm just going to use this like a break. And then the next thing I'm going to do is this. This is an abrasive cleaning stick. It's actually crepe, like a crepe soled shoe. And um, let me do this first, then we'll talk more about this. How's that for amazing? Look at how clean that sandpaper is. So you can go back out now, please. Um, these are available. Amazon has them, woodworking specialty stores have them, big box stores probably not. Um, this stick is way cheaper than constantly replacing these discs. So on a smaller scale, I've got, I've got discs like this, or I'm sorry, cleaning sticks like this that are epoxied to a piece of wood. So as I'm running a random orbit sander, then I can just set it on here for a second, clean up the disc, take it off. Um, same thing with my belt sander. As I'm using the belt sander, I can touch it down on this, clean the belt, then go back to work. Um, handheld sandpaper, kind of nothing we can do there. I guess if you really wanted to, you could rub this back and forth over the sandpaper. I never do that. Uh, but anything that you're, any power sander, an abrasive cleaning stick is a really, really good choice, a really good friend for you. Thank you. Um, Tom says, I need to paint the inside of a bathroom cabinet made out of particle board that has previously gotten wet. What grade sandpaper should I start with and end with to ensure a decent finish with water-based semi-gloss paint? Um, start with, I don't know, because I don't know how bad it is. So um, start as aggressively as you need to, to not make it take 14 years to sand. Um, you probably got to sand it up to a 180 or a 220 or so um, in order to get it to level out. Um, particle board, so we had this conversation just a little bit ago about MDF. Particle board is going to give you the same problem. I think what I would do, if it's raw particle board, I would sand it smooth and then I would seal it with um, Zinzer seal coat or a primer, a BIN bin primer, before the paint goes on. And I think if you do that, you're going to get a much better result than just putting paint on. Because the thing is too, you're, you know, you're doing this because it got wet. Now you're talking about putting a water-based paint on there. So anytime you paint, if, if you paint a piece of pine with water-based paint, it raises the grain because the water from the paint gets into the wood and it affects the wood. If you seal it first with primer or seal coat, then it, the water never has a chance to get to the wood and you don't get that grain raising. So same thing here. It, it's, it's effectively grain raising because particle board is made out of wood. So if just the latex paint goes on, I'm afraid you're not going to be happy with the result because the water from the paint will inherently cause the particle board to raise grain or raise particles, I guess. So I would really, I would seal it for sure with something that is not water based before the latex goes on. And then, like I said, on the sanding grit, you, I don't know, start at 100, and if that's a huge pain, go down to 80. And if that's a pain, go down to 60. You just gotta, I don't know how bad it is. All right, thanks, George. Um, we are here with George Vondriska, the managing editor of Woodworkers Guild of America. If you don't do so already, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can also sign up for the free newsletter at www.goa.com. And we also wanna thank Tight Bond for sponsoring uh, the, this video tonight and keeping it free for everybody. All right, Bob says, if you are on a small budget, which CNC would you purchase? What's small? I, you know, I'm trying to think of somebody, you know, Garth Brooks small or, or I don't know. Um, there's pretty good stuff out there for, for four to six thousand um, dollars. You can look at um, Iconic, Shopbot, Axiom, Laguna. Um, they've all got good stuff going. Next Wave has got good stuff going. Um, as, as CNCs are more endemic, um, 
more and more retail stores are starting to carry them. And that's cool because anytime you can walk in and you can touch and feel and look at closely a machine and speak to somebody there who's got the opportunity to tell you this is the difference between this one, this one, and this one, that's a good thing. Um, I know the Rockler and Woodcraft stores are both carrying a number of brands of CNC machines. Um, there's a newer machine out there from Powermatic. Um, I think it's at about that same price point, um, but I don't know much about it. Um, but anyway, I gave you kind of a starting point there with uh, Axiom Shopbot, Next Wave Iconic, um, machines that uh, I've had good experience with here in my shop. All right. Um, v says, I had a maple tree cut down and sitting outside drying for a year. Then I had it drawn into seven quarter planks in July. How long do I need to wait before working the wood to make um, a one and a half inch kitchen island top? Um, it depends. So as a general rule of thumb, air drying takes a year per inch of thickness. And then some people will say plus a year. So you've got seven quarter, that means it's inch and three quarter thick. For the sake of making this easy, let's just call it two. So following our general rule of thumb, a year per inch of thickness, you've got two inch stock, it's gonna take two years to dry. Then, like I said, depending on the part of your country that you're in, some people will say plus a year, that means three years for it to dry. The best thing to do is invest in a moisture meter. If you're, if you're air drying this stuff, to really be definitive about when it's ready, you gotta have a moisture meter. You're gonna pay a hundred bucks or so to have that, but it's buying you the insurance that you're not gonna start cutting into this stuff before it's ready. Um, air drying, you're generally, generally gonna get down to 12 to 14%. So if you get out there and you meter it and it's still at 20%, you know, and it's been a year, you know it's not ready. So it, it's gonna take a long time because it's so thick. Okay. Uh, John says, what coating or polish do you use to provide UV blocking for pens, specifically to prevent darkening of Purple Heart? I never have done so. I don't know. I know what you're talking about. Um, I know, you know, the effect of UV on Purple Heart is it goes from that beautiful kind of uh, um, grape bubblegum purple. It gets darker and darker and darker and darker. But I don't have an answer for you because I've never... I haven't worked with enough Purple Heart to worry about that. So I, I don't have a UV protective finish for tons. Okay, uh, Monty says, is there a chemical that I can apply to the ends of my wood blanks, lathe material ends, okay, to keep them from splitting while they are drying? Yeah, um, a common commercially available product is called Anchor Seal. And um, it's, it is designed for sealing end grain. So it'd be a great choice. Um, latex paint isn't a bad choice. Anything to prevent, uh, anything to cap those ends and try to prevent moisture from wicking out the end grain. But Anchor Seal is a commercially made product that's just for that purpose. Johnny said, you just said you cannot run end grain through a planer. Why? Um, because it's bad. Um, what happens is that um, when the planer knives are cutting end grain, they have a tendency to not cut so much as catch. And on something like an end grain cutting board, and here's the deal with this, this is one of these things, um, you get a bunch of woodworkers in a room and they can argue about this for hours. And some, some 80 year old woodworker is gonna stand here and say, I have put 200 end grain cutting boards through a planer and never had a problem. And what I'm saying is that if you have a problem, it's really, really bad. Because what happens is that if the planer catches, if the knives catch on the end grain, and they have the opportunity to fracture the piece, chunks are gonna come out of the infeed side like missiles and go screaming across your shop. So it's one of these things where, um, could a person get away with planing end grain? Possibly. Should a person try it? Never. Just in the interest of being conservative and 100% safe, I would never put an end grain piece through the planer. Just, it's, there's too much bad stuff that can happen. Okay, thank you. Um, someone says, is there a method to quickly match the stain on new wood to an existing stain on furniture or wood floors? I have a great method. It's called Sherwin-Williams. So I, I just ran into this. I had to do uh, replacement raised panel doors for two different 
houses. Um, so they brought in the broken door so that I would know what I had to make. And I took the broken door to a finishing store, Sherwin-Williams in this case, because that's what's nearby. And I said, here's a piece of red oak, raw. Um, here's the color that I have to match. And they did whatever magic they did. Um, and it cost me, I think the matching aspect of it was 20 bucks. But it was worth it because I'm telling you, it was an absolute perfect match. And I, I pointing to my finishing cabinet, I, I could have gone through my finishing cabinet and taken stains and messed with them and tried to mix them. And it would have taken me forever. And I probably never would have got it quite right. But they've got something there that's just what they do. Um, so I would definitely visit uh, not, not the paint department at a big box store, but a finishing a paint specialty store and ask them if they can color match stain for you. It's a great way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel says, do you have any advice on how to remove spray varnish? Wow, no. Uh, sanding? I, I think... I think mechanically is the only way to take it off as opposed to chemically. So scrape it, sand it. Um, and what, where I'm going with this is that in the world of finishes, um, if you get shellac on something and it's bone dry and you wipe it with denatured alcohol, you can still cut the shellac loose. If you get lacquer on something and it's bone dry and you wipe it with lacquer thinner, you can still cut it loose. If you have varnish on something and it's bone dry, um, mineral spirits is commonly the solvent for varnish. However, once varnish is dry, mineral spirits won't touch it. So I think that mechanical removal is going to be your only choice, sanding or scraping. All right. David would like to know your general thoughts on shop-made jigs, which take a lot of your time, versus specialty pre-made jigs, which are expensive. Yeah, it depends. I, I've, got, I've got a wall full of shop-made stuff. Um, I, I guess I lean toward making jigs myself for the most part, but I'm not going to make a dovetail jig, you know? I So when I get to something where it's so specialized that it pays to just pay to buy somebody else's technology, I'm okay with that. Um, a, a dovetail jig is, is a good example. Maybe it's over the top from what you're talking about, but like jigs for, I'm looking at the wall to get some ideas, jigs I use to cut tapered legs. Um, there's a bunch of those hanging up there. Jigs for doing raised panels on the table saw, shot made. Um, handheld router stuff, jigs for cutting perfect dados, shot made, hanging on that wall. So it's probably 90% or more of the jigs that are in here are shot made rather than purchased. Okay, great. Thank you, George. And again, we are here with George Von Driska, Managing Editor of Woodworkers Guild of America. If you don't do so, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter and sign up for the free newsletter. We do want to thank Titebond for sponsoring us tonight and making this completely free to you guys. Okay, Paul wants to know, what is your thoughts on chestnut wood? Is it good to work with? Uh, I think it's soft. I think chestnut and basswood are pretty close not basswood, chestnut, chestnut and butternut, I think are pretty close in working characteristics. And I've worked with butternut. Um, it was a pleasure to work with, um, but um, it is a soft material. So it's gonna show wear, it's gonna show dings and that kind of stuff pretty readily, pretty fast. Um, but um, that you're, the double check on my answer would be make sure that I'm right about chestnut and butternut being similar. Um, if they are, it, you'll be fine. You know, allow for the fact that it's soft and if you make a tabletop out of it, it's going to show wear pretty fast. And uh, while we're briefly in between questions, the, my, one of my favorite things, let me know where you are watching from. I always am very interested in knowing um, where you folks are right now. So uh, let me know where you're watching from. That's kind of cool stuff. Okay, Aubrey says, can old flaking, splintery wood be saved? The kind from antique furniture and tools that have not been cared for nicely or reclaimed from structures in disrepair. Uh, old flaky, splintery wood. I, you know, maybe if, if it's like, if the thing is just going to hang on the wall and nobody's going to touch it much, um, maybe with a little bit of sanding and then you can just kind of set it aside and be done. Um, if it's actually going to be used, 
and the wood is splintery and flaky and it's a tool, um, I would be hesitant to use it because is that wooden component going to hold up or is it going to fracture the first time you go to use it? Um, you can use, um, to an extent, you can use CA glue, cyanoacrylate, and put that into voids and fissures in the wood and kind of stabilize it. I've done that on bowls. Um, so this is an example of that. This is a piece of apple wood and it's um, it's not that it cracked, but this was just a natural um, inclusion in the wood. And in order for me to finish turning it, I had to stabilize it. So there's actually CA glue in the seam here, and that just kind of held everything together enough that I could finish hollowing this thing out. Um, so CA glue might help you a little bit with that, um, but it, it's, it's a big, it depends. It just depends on how far gone just how far gone the thing is. Okay. Um, Nicholas says, sorry to backtrack here, but do you have any recommendations as to which moisture meter would be the more bang for your buck? Um, Lignomat is a big company in moisture meters. Um, seeing, oh, I think it's actually over here. I just finished a live edge table. I had a meter before I worked with the material. So I think batteries are hot in this. This particular one is the Mini Ligno. So pretty simple function. Let me see if the batteries are good. Yeah, so um, there's two points in the end. I embed those in the work. And then the readout here gives me a reading. There's a chart that comes with it. There's two settings on here, two and three. So there's a chart that comes with it that says, depending on what species of wood you're working with, should you be on the two setting or the three setting? Uh, but yeah, Lignomat is a, is a real big name in moisture meters. So they'd be worth a look. Okay, thanks George. Um, Tim says, as a quick project, I'm building a portable tack dance floor for my granddaughter. Would a wood hardener improve the durability of a sheet of hardwood veneered plywood or should I simply go with a good floor poly? Well, I, I don't actually know what, I don't really know what wood hardener is. Um, so I don't know. I would think, boy, taps are metal, right? On the shoes. So um, pretty abrasive to the surface, but holy buckets. I mean, it, I, I feel like if you had veneered plywood and you put on, um, like a helmsman spar varnish or, you know, what do they put on gym floors? I mean, look at the abuse that they get. So um, I feel like if you put on a good floor finish, like what goes on a maple gym floor, that thing is gonna last a really, really, really long time. Um, it doesn't help that I don't know what wood hardener is, but if, if all the, if wood hardener is literally what it sounds like, which is, it would make the veneer harder. I kind of don't think that's going to solve your problem because I think what's really going to happen is the finish is going to wear before the plywood starts to wear and then you could touch up the finish. So um, my gut is saying just go with the best floor finish that you can put on there and then as she taps away on it, um, we'll keep an eye on it and when it needs to be refreshed, sand it, put another coat on and you'll be okay. Just don't let her tap through the finish to the veneer, and I think you'll be okay. Okay, thank you. Hector says, are you still using the Jessam router fence system, or have you upgraded to the new Incra? Well, I have, I still have a Jessam router. I have three router tables in here. Um, so yeah, I still have the Jessam fence, and my newest one, pointing to it over here, is a woodpecker setup. Um, very happy with both of them. Okay. Um, Ed would like your thoughts on HVLP versus LVLP spray finishing. He's new to woodworking and finishing and wants to invest his money correctly. Um, well, I, I spray with an HVLP and have no familiarity at all with LVLP. High volume, low pressure. What is that then? Low volume, low pressure? Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that in my case, I've got a, I've got a turbine. I don't run off an air compressor. 
Um, I've got a freestanding turbine with a hose that feeds to my HVLP gun, and I'm very happy with it. Been using it for a long, long, long time, and it sprays like a dream. So, okay. but I, I don't know enough. I don't know anything about LVLP to do a compare and contrast. Okay. Um, someone wants to know what is the biggest project that you have ever done. Um, biggest project I've ever done. I built a rowboat a bunch of years, a 15-foot boat. Um, that was a pretty big project. A um, couple of kitchens full of cabinets. Um, trying to think. I don't know. It's, it's probably somewhere between those two. Um, kitchen full of cabinets was actually more complex than building the boat because there's so many pieces that interact with each other. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll pick one of those. I, I, did a, I did a Bombay style chest of drawers for Minwax at one point. They needed it for an ad campaign. And that was, it wasn't big, but it was pretty complicated because it had a lot of curves in it. And I don't build a lot of stuff with curves. Most of my stuff is really, really straight line. Um, so it was just complex to figure out how all the serpentines were going to come together. Um, so that, that answer is complex more so than big. But yeah, I'll, I'll pick one of the kitchens or the boat. I was a production manager of a commercial cabinet shop for about four years. And we built every Old Navy store in the country, or half the Old Navy stores in the country and all the Banana Republic stores in the country. Um, so that was always pretty complex because that was, that was lots and lots and lots and lots of parts, lots of cabinets. Um, different stores had different needs, so there was a lot of management there just to make sure everything went right. But um, yeah, no, I'm digressing. All right. Okay, Garth says, do you have any hints or tips on using lock miter router bits across the end grain of wood? I have tried and with the grain on the edge or face is okay, but across the end grain is not working out. Yeah, so you need to, and uh, I'll, I'll put it, I know we have this video on GOA. Um, when you take that vertical piece, and you're gonna stand it up and run it along the fence. Um, you've got the face going this way and the bit going this way. And what typically happens is that it chips the heck out of that face grain. So you've gotta make your router fence into what's called a zero clearance fence. And basically what happens is you get your setup exactly right. So you know the joint is the right fit, the bit is the right height. And then with the bit running, only on the infeed side, you loosen that fence face and push it into the spinning bit. And what happens then is the, the fence face now completely surrounds the cutter so that as your material is feeding across it, it can't blow that face out on the infeed side. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that we have a video on that and I'll put the link to that in the answer to the question. Okay, Brent says, I want to repair damage on the, in the finish of a 1980s dresser. How do I know if I am dealing with poly, lacquer, or something else? Um, well, here's what I was taught, and this is a pretty cool test. So get, um, get two things, a can of denatured alcohol and a can of, excuse me, and a can of lacquer thinner. And then in a very inconspicuous spot on this piece of furniture, just take a Q-tip and st you start with the denatured alcohol. Put in the denatured alcohol and wipe the finish and see if that loosens it up. And if it does, the finish is probably shellac because denatured alcohol is the solvent for shellac. If it doesn't touch it, then we're going one solvent stronger. We're going to lacquer thinner. Dip the Q-tip, dip a new Q-tip in lacquer thinner and same thing, just swab it across the finish. If it loosens it up, then you have lacquer. If neither of those touches the finish, you probably have polyurethane. It's really, really, really important that you go in the right sequence because it's possible that lacquer thinner will cut shellac. So that's why you have to do the denatured alcohol first, then the lacquer thinner, and go from there. Okay. Maynard would like to know, George, is the ring, is the ring on your right hand a Scottish right ring? This is not my Scottish right ring. This is my regular Blue Lodge, my um, third degree ring. My Scottish right ring is in a jewelry box. But thanks for asking. Yeah, I'm a, I am a 32nd degree Mason. 
All right, and it looks like we have viewers from all over the United States, Canada, um, Yorkshire, Mexico, Paris, where I guess it's 3 a.m., Colombia, Japan, and New Zealand. I want to say Japan and Paris are two new ones. I think That's so. very cool. Yeah, I think they are. Um, and just a uh, note to, for all you guys, George is going to go back through this after we're done and he'll answer the questions that we didn't get to. Um, and he'll also go ahead and timestamp them. So tomorrow after it's been archived, you can go back and refer to it. Okay, so I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Yep. I'm just waiting for Sam to feed them through to me here. All right. Well, so let's do a little, um, where's Waldo? If you're in the, uh, if you're in Wisconsin, I'm gonna be teaching at Feral Equipment in Wausau and Feral Equipment in Eau Claire. Um, let's see, I, Eau Claire is November 4th and Wausau is I think October 28th, the Saturday before. If you go to Feral Equipment, if you go to their website, they've got information on there about the event. Um, November 11th, I'm doing CNC instruction at the Burnsville Rockler Store, Burnsville, Minnesota Rockler Store. Um, you're looking funny. Is that not a, that's a Saturday, right? Yeah. It's a Saturday. It's not on the calendar. I'm gone. So um, November 11th, I'll be in the Rockler store in Burnsville, Minnesota. It's about one to three o'clock with the CNC group down there doing some Vectric instruction and then also getting material on a, I think a next wave machine to show how to zero the X, Y, and Z and make some cuts and get things going. So um, that's my upcoming teaching schedule on the road if you're out and about a little bit. Okay. Um, Randy says, I'm thinking of getting a drum sander. What is your opinion of the Supermax 2550 sander? Well, Supermax makes great stuff, um, 2550, so it's open-ended. Um, I think it's great. I've got a Supermax 25-inch double drum, so it's closed-ended, two drums, um, and I've, I love it. So I think you will have zero complaints. All right, and Scott says, can I use regular big box store plywood for shop made jigs? Yeah, it's not a great idea because the plywood quality is marginal. Um, depending on the jig, there's some stuff hanging on my wall that's made out of MDF. There's a lot of stuff made out of Baltic birch or multi-ply plywood just because it holds up so much better. So if you're making a jig, you're gonna use one time, one and done. Big box store plywood might be okay. If it's something that you're going to use repetitively, either MDF or multiply plywood is a better choice because it's going to hold up better. It's going to be flatter. You know, and if by big box store plywood you mean like BC plywood, that's a real bad choice because it tends to be so cupped. Maybe the cabinet grade, you know, the red oak plywood a big box store sells or maple plywood might be a little bit better. But um, best choice, MDF or multiply plywood for jigs will serve you much better. Okay, and I think that might be our last question. All right, well, I wanna thank everybody for tuning in. Thanks to Typon for sponsoring this. They really help us out by keeping this free so everybody can watch. Thanks to Krista, who's over there running the camera and asking the questions, and Sam, who is somewhere off in cyberspace behind the board and uh, making sure this whole thing flows and actually gets out onto the worldwide interwebs the way it's supposed to. So that's it. Second Thursday of every month is when we do this. So at 7 p.m. Central Time on the second Thursday of November, we'll be back at this again. So uh, watch for the next one coming up. That'll be November 9th. November 9th is when the next one will be. Okay. All right. See you, folks. Thanks for tuning in.